I'm stoked to tell you guys that when I prepared for this video, I actually found out that one of the controls we're going to talk about works somewhat differently than I thought before. And without further ado, let's jump right in. So, here I am in DaVinci Resolve 17 and we're gonna talk about um, some more basic controls in the down right left area. Yep, so down here. And I can still show you even there, even though there were one, two controls to choose from the two bars down here, all those controls are still intact and we still got them. And the ones we've not been talking about so far is temperature, tint, midtone detail, color boost, shadows, and highlights. Also, let's revisit saturation today. Now, let's start off with the most basic ones of those, which I'd consider highlights and shadows control. And if we take a look at our waveform and look into the highlights control, once we drag it down, we can see that um, the brightest parts of our image just start shifting down. Whereas when we pull it up, the brightest parts of our image are shifted upwards. So what does it do? I feel it actually just takes our widest point and moves it downwards. So whereas when we take a look at our shadow control down here and we drag it down, our shadows are moved further and further towards black. Once we drag it up, you can see that the dark parts of our image get brightened. So that's pretty much what shadow control does. It takes the dark parts of our image and moves them up. So what's the difference between shadows and the lift control, you may ask now. Now if we take a look at the lift control, setting the shadows, what lift control does is actually just linearly stretch or compress the entire image. So moving all of those up by the same amount pretty much. So the same relative amount. So lift control leaves the relative spacings intact, whereas the shadows control actually pushes the darker areas further than the lighter ones. Okay, so now that we understand what shadows and highlights do, let's take a look at tint and temperature. So, first of all, uh, we're gonna start off with the tint and, um, yeah, let me reset that. Now I'm just dragging the tint towards one side. So I've actually dragged, dragged it to minus 100. So the entire image is pretty much greenish. So if we take a look there, um, it, everything is pretty much green. And um, how can we reproduce that? Actually by just dragging the gain towards a certain direction. So in order to correct that, we would just drag the gain towards the opposite direction of the green tone we just were at. And as you should see now, our chart is pretty much uniform again. We can also confirm in the vector scope that there is no saturation in the image. Now let's compare this to what happens when we actually drag our temperature control. And what you can see here is that the individual um, the individual channels are affected very, very differently, which means that in order to um, actually reproduce this, we would have to design some very complicated curves because the individual channels don't shift very linearly here. So for example, look at um, the temperature range between somewhat 560 Kelvin now and 1500 where the blue channel moves quite a considerable lot but the green channel doesn't move really at all and then when when we go to higher temperatures um, 
the green channel also starts to increase quite significantly and the blue channel gets pretty much completely annihilated. Why is that the case? Well, one way to understand it is to uh, take a look at the um, black body radiation um, chart. So this actually tells us which temperature a um, object is emitting, which color temperature, or actually at which temperature um, those wavelengths and intensities are distributed in which manner. And if we just take a brief look at those three curves here, we can see that for um, different temperatures, so this is the wavelength area we are interested in, um, the individual wavelengths are distributed very very differently. So while we have an almost linear curve at 4000 Kelvin um, that is rather steep and we have a rather, um, ra rather shallow um, curve at 3000 Kelvin, we have a very steep one at 5 that then again decays downwards. So um, in other words, we just can't reproduce that behavior with some linear adjustments which we were used to before. And that's pretty much where the temperature control comes in pretty handy because um, it actually overtakes this nonlinear behavior for us. So what does midtone detail do? So if we increase midtone detail, we can see those tiny edges pop up around here, um, mainly in the midtone areas. So um, like in those areas. And why do they pop up there? Well, uh, first of all, because it's midtone and second is that's why it's called detail is because the wind resolve looks for those um, high contrast areas or rather for um, the edges inside an image that's done by so-called Fourier transformation and around those edges it locally enhances the contrast so um, if you take a brief look at the blue areas here and then you take a brief look at the yellow areas here, you will see that the blue areas do not shift at all, but the yellow areas are shifting rather vastly. So when I turn down the midtone detail again, you can see that the yellow areas are moving quite a big lot, whereas the blue areas um, stay at the same position where they were before. So in fact, we are really only affecting the edges of our image and we're increasing contrast more in the midtones. So that's why this is very useful, for example, uh, refining skin by actually um, decreasing midtone details because then the skin looks sort of smoother and less wrinkled, for example. On the other hand, if you want to bring up those wrinkles, crank up the midtone detail. Okay. Now, what's the difference between color boost and saturation. Well, let me start off with the saturation. Take a look at the vector scope and see that when I increase the saturation or I decrease the saturation, all those points on the vector scope are just scaled with a linear multiplication. So we're just linearly multiplying saturation into it. So whenever um, we're increasing it, those are all multiplied by the same factor. Now, so one thing you should know about color boost and saturation is that when we draw a saturation versus saturation chart, the curves that we're multiplying um, our um, image with are sort of linear for the saturation and sort of logarithmic for the color boost. This means that um, values that are less saturated in the beginning get more saturated with the color boost, but stay less saturated when, when we use saturation. So let's take a look at a vector scope. So I'm dialing up saturation now, and we can see that the middle of the vector scope still stays pretty dense. So there's 
few saturation in the image in the beginning and then by multiplying it with more saturation it doesn't really get more so now let's compare that to the color contra uh, to the color boost so saturation back to 50 and now let's go to the color boost and once i pull on the color boost we can see that inside our vector scope um, that's not so much going on anymore in the middle so uh, we actually are saturating those colors that have been desaturated before quite a bit now so that's one difference the other thing you should know about saturation and color boost is when they are applied because saturation is applied after primary corrections whereas color boost in fact is applied before so this means that when we turn up the set uh, when we turn up the saturation we're scaling from the middle as I said but then if we apply an offset those are scaled differently just look at that tiny blob between red and yellow here somewhere and then let's move the offset again and you will see that it's not just moving but those colors are actually offset first and then they are scaled by the saturation now let's reset that now what happens if we apply um, color boost instead of saturation so saturation back to 50 and now we're applying a color boost and again we're seeing that those colors are scaled as we said before so with that logarithmic thing around the zero but now um, if we're applying some offset we're actually just shifting the entire thing so there's not really much going on we're just dragging around the entire thing and shifting it around our zero point in the vector scope so i hope you gained some new insights into the basic controls of the wind shear solve and now that we're finally getting done with those we can really move on to the exciting stuff so if you liked what you saw like and subscribe stay tuned and catch you next time